The Desire of Ages, Chapter 4 Unto You a Saviour The King of Glory stooped low to take humanity. Rude and forbidding were his earthly surroundings. His glory was veiled that the majesty of his outward form might not become an object of attraction. He shunned all outward display. Riches, worldly honour and human greatness can never save a soul from death. Jesus purposed that no attraction of an earthly nature should call men to his side. Only the beauty of heavenly truth must draw those who would follow him. The character of the Messiah had long been foretold in prophecy and he desired men to accept him upon the testimony of the word of God. The angels had wondered at the glorious plan of redemption. They had watched to see how the people of God would receive his Son, clothed in the garb of humanity. Angels came to the land of the chosen people. Other nations were dealing in fables and worshipping false gods. To the land where the glory of God had been revealed and the light of prophecy had shone, the angels came. They came unseen to Jerusalem to the appointed expositors of the sacred oracles and the ministers of God's house. Already to Zacharias the priest, as he ministered before the altar, the nearness of Christ's coming had been announced. Already the forerunner was born, his mission attested by miracle and prophecy. The tidings of his birth and the wonderful significance of his mission had been spread abroad. Yet, Jerusalem was not preparing to welcome her Redeemer. With amazement, the heavenly messengers beheld the indifference of that people whom God had called to communicate to the world the light of sacred truth. The Jewish nation had been preserved as a witness that God was to be born of the seed of Abraham and of David's line, yet they knew not that his coming was now at hand. In the temple, the morning and the evening sacrifice daily pointed to the Lamb of God, yet even here was no preparation to receive him. The priests and teachers of the nation knew not that the greatest event of the ages was about to take place. They rehearsed their meaningless prayers and performed the rites of worship to be seen by men. But in their strife for riches and worldly honor, they were not prepared for the revelation of the Messiah. The same indifference pervaded the land of Israel. Hearts selfish and world engrossed were untouched by the joy that thrilled all heaven. Only a few were longing to behold the unseen. To these, heaven's embassy was sent. Angels attend Joseph and Mary as they journey from their home in Nazareth to the city of David. The decree of imperial Rome for the enrollment of the peoples of her vast dominion has extended to the dwellers among the hills of Galilee. As in old times Cyrus was called to the throne of the world's empire that he might set free the captors of the Lord, so Caesar Augustus is made the agent for the fulfillment of God's purpose in bringing the mother of Jesus to Bethlehem. She is of the lineage of David, and the son of David must be born in David's city. Out of Bethlehem, said the prophet, shall he come forth, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from the days of eternity. But in the city of their royal line, Joseph and Mary are unrecognized and unhonored. Weary and homeless, they traverse the entire length of the narrow street from the gate of the city to the eastern extremity of the town, vainly seeking a resting place for the night. There is no room for them at the crowded inn. In a rude building where the beasts are sheltered, they at last find refuge. And here, the Redeemer of the world is born. Men know it not, but the tidings fill heaven with rejoicing. 
With a deeper and more tender interest, the holy beings from the world of light are drawn to the earth. The whole world is brighter for his presence. Above the hills of Bethlehem are gathered an innumerable throng of angels. They wait the signal to declare the glad news to the world. Had the leaders in Israel been true to their trust, they might have shared the joy of heralding the birth of Jesus. But now they are passed by. God declares, I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. Unto the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. To those who are seeking for light and who accept it with gladness, the bright rays from the throne of God will shine. In the fields where the boy David has led his flock, shepherds were still keeping watch by night. Through the silent hours they talked together of the promised Savior and prayed for the coming of the King to David's throne. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. At these words, visions of glory fill the minds of the listening shepherds. The Deliverer has come to Israel. Power, exaltation, triumph are associated with his coming. But the angel must prepare them to recognize their Savior in poverty and humiliation. This shall be a sign unto you, he says. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. The heavenly messenger had quieted their fears. He had told them how to find Jesus. With tender regard for their human weakness, he had given them time to become accustomed to the divine radiance. Then the joy and glory could no longer be hidden. The whole plain was lightened up with the bright shining of the hosts of God. Earth was hushed and heaven stooped to listen to the song. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, good will toward men. Oh, that today the human family could recognize that song. The declaration then made, the note then struck, will swell to the close of time and resound to the ends of the earth. When the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings, that song will be re-echoed by the voice of a great multitude as the voice of many waters saying, Hallelujah! For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. As the angels disappeared, the light faded away, and the shadows of night once more fell on the hills of Bethlehem. But the brightest picture ever beheld by human eyes remained in the memory of the shepherds. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Departing with great joy, they made known the things they had seen and heard, and all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God. Heaven and earth are no wider apart today than when shepherds listen to the angels' song. Humanity is still as much the object of heaven's solicitude as when common men of common occupations met angels at noonday and talked with the heavenly messengers in the vineyards in the fields. To us, in the common walks of life, heaven may be very near. 
angels from the courts above will attend the steps of those who come and go at God's command. The story of Bethlehem is an exhaustless theme. In it is hidden the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. We marvel at the Savior's sacrifice in exchanging the throne of heaven for the manger and the companionship of adoring angels for the beasts of the storm. Human pride and self-sufficiency stand rebuked in his presence. Yet this was but the beginning of the wonderful condescension. It would have been an almost infinite humiliation for the Son of God to take man's nature even when Adam stood in his innocence in Eden. But Jesus accepted humanity when the race had been weakened by 4,000 years of sin. Like every child of Adam, he accepted the results of the working of the great law of heredity. What these results were is shown in the history of his earthly ancestors. He came with such a heredity to share our sorrows and temptations and give us the example of a sinless life. Satan in heaven had hated Christ for his position in the courts of God. He hated him more when he himself was dethroned. He hated him who pledged himself to redeem a race of sinners. Yet, into the world where Satan claimed dominion, God permitted his son to come, a helpless babe, subject to the weakness of humanity. He permitted him to meet life's peril in common with every human soul, to fight the battle as every child of humanity must fight it at the risk of failure and eternal loss. The heart of the human father yearns over his son. He looks into the face of his little child and trembles at the thought of life's peril. He longs to shield his dear one from Satan's power, to hold him back from temptation and conflict, to meet a bitterer conflict and a more fearful risk. God gave his only begotten son that the path of life might be made sure for our little ones. Here in is love. Wonder, O heavens, and be astonished, O earth.